Welcome to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this segment is Brian Keim. He's a senior analyst over at Forrester Research, and we're going to talk cyber threat intelligence. Brian, welcome to Security Weekly. Thank you for having me, Matt. Now, I'm going to frame this a little bit so we can get into the discussion. You know, I, I, I monitored the threat intelligence market, you know, maybe five, six years ago. And one mm -hmm. of the challenges, I think, with s the threat intelligence market back then was lots of feeds. How do you extract value out of those threat mm -hmm. intelligence feeds? And it, 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 it's gone through some ebbs and flows over the years. Kind of where, what's been happening over those past five or six years? And kind of where are we right now with, with cyber threat intelligence? So it's it's really it's expanding it's, it's contracting and all there there are some acquisitions and mergers there's more of the uh, uh, email vendors and, and other vendors that are acquiring uh, smaller threat intelligence vendors to round out their their products and services. You know I thought with going into this pandemic that honestly a lot of the vendors that I cover that I speak to regularly would be struggling and there are a lot of businesses that are struggling due to this pandemic. But actually, a lot of the vendors in, in my space are they're hitting their sales goals and they are sometimes exceeding their sales goals. They're doing really well. And this to me is a signal that a lot of the buyers are actually starting to realize the value of hmm. threat intelligence. You know, I come from Army Intelligence and my job description always said I reduce risk and uncertainty to the unit. And, and that's really what our goal should be in cyber threat intelligence. And so I think we're seeing some actualization of that, that um, the end user is seeing that there is just an incredible amount of uncertainty here. I have information gaps. I need uh, someone to help me fill those gaps. And, and the vendors in this space are, are finally able to really come in and demonstrate that value now. I had Richard Stein in on earlier in the week from IT Harvest, and we were talking about the whole market scape. And one of the the numbers he gave me actually kind of surprised me a little bit. I think he said the threat intelligence vendor market's growing at 38%. The average is 34%. I thought that was a little high, but you just kind of reiterated aspects of that is yep. the, the market is thriving even even in a lockdown uh, scenario. Yeah, yeah. I I agree with Richard in that aspect, yeah. Okay, good. Now, one of the big challenges has been how to effectively operationalize threat intelligence, right? Y yeah. We're going to maybe talk a little bit about how many feeds <laughs> or, or sources, <laughs> as you said. Yep. Uh, yeah. What, what, you know, the, how many is enough? How many aren't enough? How do I operationalize all those feeds? Because I think one of the really big challenges has been operationalizing it and getting value out of those, out of those different sources. Yeah, you know, before you even go to acquire some threat intelligence vendor, you really need that intelligence collection plan. And before you really build your collection plan, you kind of got to understand what your your key intelligence questions or your priority intelligence requirements are. So you need some kind of process uh, to elicit those requirements from all of your stakeholders throughout your organization. So not just the CISO, but security architecture, uh, your PR teams, your marketing teams, your uh, operational leaders, if you're in manufacturing, it's your um, your plant managers and so forth. You know what what gaps do they have with securing those environments, with protecting the business's reputation? Because when you talk to the boards, you know reputational risk is, is always going to be at the top of their risk agenda. So once you have that, your your key intelligence questions, your priority intelligence requirements, you start aligning your intelligence sources there. And you should start internally. You know, what do I have internally that can answer those things there? And then when you have a, a gap there, a blank in that collection plan, then you need to go find vendors for that. So there shouldn't be a, a, a goal of just collecting everything you can. You need to collect what you need that fits your plan, which helps you answer those stakeholder requirements. It could be one vendor. It could be some open source feeds. Uh, it might be a collection of, uh, of different vendors. So uh, the recommendation here is not to just buy as many feeds as you can. Nope. <laughs> you, you really nope. need to think strategically through, all right, where do I have a gap in my intelligence collection mm -hmm. capabilities? And then yep. find the appropriate vendors. Because what I've seen is in the early days, it was all about threat intelligence integration into the SIM, right? 
yep. provide more contextual information to the sim. But we've seen other markets leverage threat intelligence to help them as well. We talked a little bit about email. We talked about vulnerability management, for example, right? Yep. Prioritization in the threat vulnerability management space requires mm -hmm. you to have some of that contextual data. So now you're seeing the vulnerability management vendors integrate in threat feeds. Those aren't going to the exactly. SIM necessarily. Uh, the same with exactly. email, right? Exactly. You know, actually in our annual survey, we do ask our respondents about intelligence use cases and vulnerability is the number one answer actually. And so your old employer, Tenable, I think is actually doing some really good things around uh, vulnerability prioritization. So they're doing a lot of data science on which vulnerabilities are being exploited, likely to see exploitation. You know, there is actual absolute use case to get in your um, underground criminal markets or your deep and dark web uh, and, and really find out what vulnerabilities the threats are interested in which what capabilities are they buying and selling and trading amongst each other's and that is, is half of prioritization of course but that is a very very good use case for uh cyber threat intelligence yeah and and i think tenable is doing it both at the it side and now the ot side um yes. are, are yep. there good feeds for the OT side of the business? Because look, industrial control systems, operational technology has been kind of one of those areas ignored over the number of years. Now that we're seeing more focus on these types of systems, are there valid feeds that really help kind of augment that vulnerability detection side? Yeah, the, um, th there is very limited ICS threat intelligence. Uh, so if you're overseas on the other side of the pond, you're probably looking at Kaspersky's uh, industrial cybersecurity practice over there. And then stateside, you really have two choices, and that's FireEye's cyber physical team and uh, Drago's security. And, and Drago's is, of those, the only ICS and critical infrastructure specific, you know, they, they focus solely on those uh, personas, those organizations, and, and, and they are... Um, I'm a prior client, you know, full disclosure, um, they do some really good work in this space, but it really does take some really specialized knowledge to produce threat intelligence that is specific to those OT leaders. Yeah, I know Rob Lee really well. I mean, what he's yeah. built over at Drago has been fantastic. I mean, that's his focus. He knows that market in and out. Mm -hmm. One of the areas I haven't seen a lot of threat intelligence integration yet, it's kind of this emerging space around application security. We talk vuln management, but I think about threat intelligence feeds from a vulnerability management perspective, really being more focused at the device, the operating system, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing trends or, or will we see trends on threat intelligence at the application layer in some of the different AppSec uh, vendors that are out there? I mean, that market's expanded uh, greatly. Yep. We had Sandy on yesterday, uh, one of mm -hmm. your colleagues. You know, we've, we've talked with her about bot detection, some other stuff, but yep. that market's getting really big, but I'm not seeing as much threat intelligence integration there is it valid You're are not we the only seeing one. it okay uh there there's obviously some use cases there um if if we're building bad code you know then downstream effects from there so um sandy actually introduced me to one vendor um i want to say that was sneak s-n-y-k and they have some intelligence around the appsec side but it, it is not common and it's definitely a use case, and if you are a developer, you should definitely have an understanding of how a threat may exploit your your code. Right, yeah. Uh, it, are there other markets like that that haven't fully embraced threat intelligence and the ability to correlate that threat intelligence into that sub-market? Um, none that I can think of. Now, there are industry verticals that are slow to bring in threat intelligence to defend their own environments. Um, manufacturing, I think, is on the uh, is, is a laggard in there. And we're seeing that with some of the recent ransomware events like at Honda uh, last year's um, Norsk Hydro uh, Locker Goga event and, and several others in the space. They kind of I think manufacturing sat in this kind of soft spot where they didn't attract a whole lot of criminal activity because you know, manufacturing facilities don't have a whole lot of customer data and so forth. Not a whole lot they can steal and sell. And then with state-sponsored threats, you know, uh, Honda is not really a critical infrastructure asset owner. Um, I can't shut off the lights or anything. I can't achieve like some kind of strategic uh, effect by 
ransoming um, or or destroying the networks that they you know manufacture so much. Um, but that's not true anymore because now we see things like not Petya, Locker Goga, the Ecans ransomware, and and now manufacturing facilities are being impacted by some of these events of this varying criminal or or state nature. So. Um, manufacturing definitely needs to bring in some, of course, OT specific threat intelligence, um, but they need, you know, your general um, broad threat intelligence as well. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, from a maturity level, I think manufacturing has been further behind the security maturity curve anyway. Yeah. So threat yep. intelligence would be one of those things you uh, would come in later because yep. there's probably so many other things in that uh, industry that have to be kind of mature before you're ready to take uh, a feed from a, from a threat intelligence source, right? Yeah, that, that's that's key. You know, a lot of buyers or, or or end user clients are just not sophisticated enough honestly for some of the intelligence that a dragos or a FireEye or a crowdstrike produces they, they don't know how to take that apt fuzzy snuggly duck report and and do anything except for put the iocs at the end into their sim you know being able to actually read and understand a threat's intent objectives and how they carry out an intrusion is takes a little more sophistication um, and so there's a lot of education that we need to do in this side. Um, so on, on what what um, you know CISOs and, and organizations should do though in the intelligence field, honestly, is you know the board wants to protect their reputation. So honestly, the brand kind of focused intelligence vendors, Digital Shadows, Record Future, Zero Fox, um, Insights, and those vendors in there that look for phishing, domain spoofing, spoofed. Um, uh, spoofed um, social media profiles and so forth that could provide a little a, a lot of value and start to introduce the organization to the value of threat intelligence. And when I refer to the uh, vendors that are doing really well during COVID nineteen, uh, specifically it's those vendors because we see the I mean, where does domain tools count like somewhere north of one hundred fifty thousand uh, illegitimate domains referencing coronavirus, COVID nineteen, or pandemic or something. Right. So. It, it, it's very useful, and from your lowest level security operations center analyst up to the CEO and the board, they kind of understand uh, what phishing is and, and how it can impact their brand. Has the MITRE, we were talking MITRE attack framework last night. Mm -hmm. Has MITRE attack framework actually helped the threat intelligence vendors a little bit? Because now, when you bring the threat intelligence in with some of these other solutions, are, are did the, the MITRE attack framework actually help the threat intelligence vendors um, with some of that contextual correlation? Because now we have this matrix that we can use to really look at how attacks propagate in, in the techniques that are being used. I think it definitely has helped them. Of course, really the goal is to help our defenders in all these environments. And uh, again, like the lack of sophistication, I think it's taken some time to make our defenders a little smarter on something like MITRE ATT&CK and how they can use it, how they can see gaps in their own security, how can they understand their own threat landscape by using MITRE ATT&CK to, um, you know, to build some really good, powerful metrics based off that, but also to influence the red teaming and the pen testing and adversary emulation. Uh, how do we build, you know, a secure defense in depth or a zero trust architecture when you have the data that comes out of MITRE ATT&CK? I, I think that helps guide those conversations with those various stakeholders. So MITRE ATT&CK has, has been really useful. I, I think it's going to become more useful. You know, we talked ICS a little bit. Now there's the ICS ATT&CK uh, framework. And so I think we are going to see um, a lot of benefits there. We'll really see more benefits when... The MSSPs, when the network security providers start adding MITRE ATT&CK techniques to all of their alerting, their snort rules, and, and, and other detections there, because the focus really has been on the endpoint tools right now. Right. And, and for a defender to kind of see everything going on, they really need attack throughout the, um, the whole life cycle throughout their um, both network and, and host controls. Yeah, one of the things we highlighted last night was we did a mapping between MITRE ATT&CK and PCI, and 30% of the mitigations boiled down to configuration management, uh, which I thought yeah. was really, really interesting because it's not a very sexy topic for most security organizations, but these misconfigurations are creating a lot of the holes yeah. for these breaches to happen. Yeah. Yep.
Absolutely. You know, every day there's an, an AWS bucket that is wide open and, you know, so it's, it's real. Yeah. W- what does the market look like over the next couple of years? Do we stay on this 38% growth path that, that Richard stated the other day? Does it consolidate, slow down? What does it look like over the next couple of years? What can we expect out of the threat intelligence market? So, I expect growth to continue for definitely a little bit. Um, Uncertainty is not going to um, settle down to a more normal level until we see the vaccine, until we're really back out and and doing this in person. Um, I expect there will be some acquisitions and mergers. Um, There's still VC money coming in. You know, both uh, Census and Gray Noise actually got VC money or they announced VC money this week. So there is continued investment. I have private equity firms coming to me for inquiry, asking about a lot of the vendors in this space. So there is some appetite. There's some money on the sideline and and the PE and the VCs are looking to do something with it. And they are looking at the threat intelligence vendors uh, because I I think they're seeing some of the same things that Richard and I are seeing that that, um, the end users, the buyers are seeing value. Um, They they, they see that they have gaps and, and they need help with it. Um, one space that I think we will probably see some innovation in is around disinformation. Uh, there's only one vendor I know that really does uh, dedicated work in the disinformation space. And this goes way beyond just sentiment analysis or looking at spoof uh, social media profiles. Uh, this is, you know, looking at, you know, trying to assess what narratives are being artificially uh, amplified mm-hmm. and, and so forth with uh an an emerging you know with with vaccines going into what phase two phase three trials or so forth you know maybe we'll have a viable vaccine here in the next uh, six months or so and i completely expect um some of our our strategic adversaries to use their uh disinformation and influence operations playbooks to continue to sow chaos in, in the west around around the vaccines to um you know to promote the anti vaxxer crowds to um, look at alternative vaccines, maybe that aren't as um, as, as beneficial, and maybe try to sow some distrust amongst the different vaccines. You know, which one do I get? Do I get this one from this pharmaceutical company? This one from this one? We've already seen the, those state-sponsored threats actually breach some of these uh, pharmaceutical companies that are are doing research in the vaccine. So um, it's it's going to be a real interesting uh, second half of, of 2020 for sure. Yeah, and I think the first part of 2021 as well. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, Brian, if people want to get some more of the research, where can they go to find some of the research uh, that you've been producing over at Forrester? Uh, definitely, you know, Forrester.com. Um, search for my name and, and you'll find I have a, a blog in front of our paywall. And, and I tend to preview a lot of the uh, finished research there. And then, you know, hit me up on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, happy to have, you know, some conversations, talk generally about the research and, and my own personal opinions. There's lots of things that I I see and read and hear that uh, doesn't get into research. So I'm happy to share that, you know, through, um, through social media. That's great. Brian, thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. Thanks for having me, Matt. And with that, we'll take a short break and come back with more interviews for Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. 